What's the most important thing you could ever know? That's a serious question. Many different things could come to mind. But the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what is of first importance? This is the most important thing you could ever know. Anyone could ever know. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that it appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, <clears throat> most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and all the apostles. Last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. What's of most importance? What's of first importance? The most important thing you could ever know is that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. There are two things perfectly wed together in this passage. There's the history, the facts of it, and there's the doctrine. The facts of history are that Jesus of Nazareth a man who was born in Bethlehem when Quirinius was the governor of Syria, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. This man lived, died, rose again. These are the facts. What do they mean? Why did he die? He died for our sins. Why did he live? To fulfill all righteousness. Why was he raised? For our justification. <laughs> it's so amazing. He died. That's facts. He died for our sins. That's doctrine. As Machen said, these two things are wed together in indissoluble union. Without these two pieces, there is no Christianity. The most important thing anyone could ever know is that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried, and on the third day was raised again for their justification. And so my burden is for pastors to consider their calling. What does it mean to preach? What does it mean to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. Paul says, him we proclaim, Colossians. Him we proclaim. What does it mean to proclaim him? What does it mean to be a preacher? See, you go into so many churches today and you find teaching that's geared towards the practical applications, practical needs of the saints. Of course, there's a place for that. There's a place for practical application. There's a place for where the rubber meets the road. There's, there's a place for stewarding people and, and people stewarding their resources. Man has a duty towards God. Of course he does. He's a creature. But if you're looking for a life coach, if you're looking for tips, good advice, a better way to live, you can find answers. You don't have to be a Christian. But if you want to know if anything has been done to save you from your sin, from death, hell, judgment, and the grave, then you need the facts of redemption. See, the, the role of a preacher is to proclaim the good news about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus died. He was buried. He descended to the dead. And on the third day, 
he rose again. This faith once delivered to the saints, this faith of Jesus Christ, is the heart of Christian proclamation. The most important thing you could ever know is not life tips, good advice, a hack for your best life now. No, the most important thing you could ever know is news. What has been done by God in history for you? And so the role of the preacher is that of a herald, is to proclaim good news, is to travel to the ends of the earth to tell the nations that God in Jesus Christ has done the reconciling work of redemption, that God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. And so we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors of Christ. This is the role of preaching, to step into the pulpit and proclaim the excellencies of him who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light, to unpack the riches of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. That's the main meta narrative of the whole Bible. When we're reading in the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, what is it all about? Right? It's about a promise that the seed of a woman would crush a serpent. It's about an offspring of Abraham who would be multiplied to be more numerous than the stars in the sky. Right? It's about a Passover lamb who would redeem his people from slavery. It's about a perfect sacrifice that will bring, that will forgive sins and bring people into the presence of God, restoring fellowship and relationship, making a way where there is no way. It's about a king who will rule the nations with justice and peace, who will bring good news to the captives and restore the cosmic order of all things who will make all things new with the authority that he has as the king of all kings, the king of creation. This is the proclamation. When we go back into the Old Testament, we are not merely looking for morality tales, fables, stories to make us feel good or to challenge us or to teach us how to live. Of course, the law is good. The law was given by God. The law does provide instruction on what love for God and neighbor looks like. And the law also exposes our human corruption and our inability to be good, righteous, holy, before a holy God. And we can learn things about ourselves and about life. There is wisdom in the Bible. There are proverbs. There are many things that are good words, things that can help us live better. But that is not what it means to preach. And that is not what it means to preach Christ. When Paul said to the Corinthians, I wanted to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. It's quite clear that he is not merely a life coach or a moral teacher. He is proclaiming news. Right? Just like when the war, World War II ended, and there was an announcement around the globe of victory, that the Allied powers had won, that the war was over. This news came to people where they were all over the globe. Good news. The war is over. Victory has been achieved. That deeply impacted people's lives. Their emotions changed. Their thoughts changed. Their mindsets changed. There was metanoia, right? There was transformation, a kind of repentance where you had a mindset of war and now you have a mindset of victory and peace. But that was affected by 
the proclamation of good news. Something had been done apart from you, outside of you, in history. And this is where preaching comes in. God has done something for you, outside of you, apart from you, in history, that's really, really good. He has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. See, all we like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So the role of the preacher is to be a herald, to be the one who goes to the center of the city and proclaims the message who releases the headline good news christ is victorious <laughs> this is why we see in places like isaiah 40 the lord says to the prophet i'll be there in a second comfort comfort my people says your god speak tenderly to jerusalem Cry to her. Her warfare has ended. The war's over. Her iniquity is pardoned. We have the forgiveness of sins. She's received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. Later on, it says, Get up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold your God. What are we giving people when we proclaim the gospel? We're giving them Christ. Behold your God, crucified for your sins, buried in the grave, risen again for your justification. Behold his victory. That's your victory through faith and fellowship in him. Behold your God. He comes with might. His reward is with him. His recompense before him. You have this victorious king coming from battle and triumph. The war is over. And what does he do? Well, the prophet says, He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. <laughs> so this, this victorious king has conquered our enemies, defeated our sin, he comes in victory to speak tenderly to us, to allure us to himself, to care for us as a good shepherd. Such a beautiful picture of the diverse excellencies of Jesus Christ. Jonathan Edwards has a wonderful sermon called the, On the Diverse Excellencies of Jesus Christ. And he speaks to this where you have the majesty and the meekness of Christ married together. He's the lion-like lamb and the lamb-like lion. He's the lion and the lamb at the same time. No one is more majestic than Jesus. No one is more meek than Jesus. No one's more highly exalted than Jesus. No one is more humiliated than Jesus. He feels all in all. He, he was subject to death, even death on a cross, obeying all the way to the end. And God has highly exalted him, giving the name above every name. So can we see the humiliation, the exaltation of Christ. What are we proclaiming? We're proclaiming just that. As Peter says, the prophets beforehand spoke of his sufferings and his subsequent glories. These two things, the suffering and the glory, the humiliation and the exaltation, the lion and the lamb, these are what we proclaim. It's all about Jesus, our triumphant king, the good shepherd, who comes to us in his victory to give us the spoils of what he's won for us, right? And when we mine the Old Testament, we find example after example of what Jesus is like, what he's going to do. And, and not only that, we find out who he is. It's the offspring of Abraham, the seed of the woman, the offspring of David, right? And like David, Jesus, our David, goes out and faces Goliath. He defeats the devil. He defeats sin. He delivers us from our enemies. So when you read the story of David, it's not meant to be a story about how you, like David, can go get five smooth stones and defeat the giants in your life. 
when you read the story, you need to understand Jesus is David. And we, his people, believers, those who hope in him, those who are united to this true and better David by faith, we're on the sidelines as Israelites. And all those spiritual enemies, death, devil, hell, grave, particularly the devil, according to Hebrews 2, we're looking across the valley and there is death. There is the devil standing against us. And none of us can go out and face him. None of us are strong enough. We are all going to be defeated. And yet here comes our David, Jesus. And he strides into the valley of the shadow of death for us. And he takes out the giant, slings his stone, hits him in the head, takes the sword of the giant and slices his head off. Right? He defeated death by death. It was the, it was the devil's own weapon, right? The power of death. He defeated the one who had the power of death. That is the devil. Takes the devil's own weapon, death, and slays him with it. So we see Jesus all over the Old Testament. And it's beautiful. And this is our God. And this is the pattern. So when we go to Luke chapter 24, Jesus has risen from the dead. But not everyone knows that yet. But he appears to two of his disciples who are walking on the road to Emmaus and they're downcast. And he's like, why are you sad? And they're like, are you the only person who doesn't know what's been going on here the last couple of days? We thought Jesus was the Messiah promised in the Old Testament scriptures. Of course, they don't call it the Old Testament. They just call it the scriptures. But they're referring to Genesis to Malachi. And that's an important point. We thought he was the one. And then Jesus starting with Moses and all the prophets and the Psalms, right, the whole Old Testament, he proclaims to them all things concerning himself. So Jesus walks along the Emmaus Road, and he explains the scriptures in light of his life, his death, his resurrection, his suffering, his glory, his victory. He proclaims himself as the center and of course, they stop and he dines with them and he breaks bread and they recognize him and he vanishes. And they rush back to tell the other disciples, we have seen the Lord. He is risen. And that is at the heart of our proclamation. Every Sunday, we're going to the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to proclaim him, to proclaim his excellencies, to tell again the old, old story, to once again placard the headlines. He is risen. He is crucified for you. He is buried for you. He is risen for you. It's for you. It happened. He did it. It's finished. The war is over. It's for you. Enjoy the spoils of his victory. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Take, eat. This body was broken for you. Take and drink. This blood was shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. It's for you, saint. This is the job of the pastor, to minister the words and the sacraments, to give people Christ. And so we need to learn how to do this well. And we learn by looking at the pattern that Jesus gives us in the scriptures. He interpreted all things to himself. When we go into the book of Acts, the story, Luke's recording, he's an excellent historian. Luke's pedigree, his style, his ability as a historian is well documented. Luke is good at what he does, and he has recorded for us a trustworthy account of the church's earliest days and how it is they went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth with the good news of this amazing victory wrought by the king of kings, the son of David, the son of Abraham, son of a woman, seed of a woman who was born under the law, to die for our sins, to grant us adoption, to was raised for our justification. This good news about Jesus, they are spreading it everywhere, even to the ends of the earth. And as we look in the book of Acts, we have examples of what the apostles were preaching. <laughs> they were not preaching how to have your best life now. They were explicitly preaching the gospel 
over against the law, saying that you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. You cannot be justified by being good. None is righteous. No, not one. No, what you need is this Christ, the one who was promised beforehand in the prophets, the one who has fulfilled the Father's will, the one who has died for sinners, the one who was raised. And in him and in him alone, you have life. In him and in him alone, you have justification. In him, you have everything that you couldn't have any other way. And they prove from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. See, the Jews were searching the scriptures. As Jesus said to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life. But these are they which speak of me, and you won't come to me. They had Moses, or so they thought. But Jesus said, Moses, he wrote about me. <laughs> Moses is not going to justify you in the eschaton. Moses won't be your vindication. No, Moses will be your judge. He'll condemn you for your rejection of me. Jesus proclaimed himself as the center of revelation and redemption. And the apostles followed in his steps. They had witnessed the risen Lord. As we just read here in 1 Corinthians 15, he was seen by Peter and James and the apostles, by 500 people at one time, most of whom were still alive at the time of this letter being written. And he said, last of all, he appeared to me. So we have eyewitness, credible eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we have the interpretive lens of the Old Testament. We know where Jesus was to be born, Bethlehem and Judea. And he was born there. We have all of these specific prophecies coming over, over a thousand years, all throughout the Old Testament. All these prophecies, some of them couldn't, were not even fulfilled in Jesus' lifetime. Prophecies about the spread of the gospel and the inclusion of the Gentiles. And, and yet, we have seen this take place. So this is what we are proclaiming. This is what it means to preach. It's to herald the gospel. So you spend week after week, year after year, mining the riches of Christ for you from all of Scripture, proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of light, out of darkness, into his marvelous light. Over and over again. You proclaim Christ from Genesis. You proclaim Christ from Exodus. You proclaim Christ from Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, over and, and through and through and through, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, the Psalms, Job, Proverbs, and on and on and on. Genesis to Malachi, you find Jesus there because he's really there to be found. Because Jesus said, these are they which speak of me. Because Jesus interpreted the Old Testament as being all about him. Because Peter said the prophets were prophesying beforehand the sufferings and glory of Christ. Because John said that when Isaiah was in the temple and he saw the Lord high and lifted up, that it was Jesus. <laughs> okay? Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. The patriarchs knew Jesus. Moses knew Jesus. This is the truth. Now, they didn't know Jesus in the incarnation because the incarnation was a historical event. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He was born in a specific time period, in a specific place, to a specific woman and family. And yet, the one who is God, who became man for us and for our salvation, he was known, he was prophesied beforehand by the power of the Spirit through the prophetic witness that this Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucify, as Peter said, God has made him both Lord and Christ. He is the Savior of the world, right? John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. This is our proclamation over and over again, pointing people to him, reminding people of him, giving him to people. Christ for you. Christ is enough. Behold your God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Trust in him. Just like Moses put the bronze serpent on the pole in the wilderness so that whoever looked to it would not die. So God gave his only son, his begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Look and live. Look to Christ. So every week, week after week, you hold up Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. You give Christ. Take and eat. It's for you.
over and over again. And this administration of Christ, this ambassadorship for Christ, this proclamation of Christ produces faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of Christ. So faith is produced in the hearts of people through the proclamation of the gospel. The Spirit works faith in the heart of believers. And God's children come to faith and they recognize this is my Redeemer. It's not only for others, it's for me too. So, again, you can see that I'm quite passionate about this. But this is the apostolic pattern. When we look in the book of Acts, as I said, we see them preaching Christ, proving from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. We get to the early church. We see Irenaeus on the uh, demonstration of apostolic preaching. He is goes on and on through the Old Testament, just like Jesus on the Emmaus Road, just like the apostles in the book of Acts. So Irenaeus in the middle of the second century is proclaiming Jesus as the fulfillment of all. And so he says, Thus then he, Jesus, gloriously achieved our redemption and fulfilled the promise of the fathers and abolished the old disobedience. The Son of God became Son of David and Son of Abraham, perfecting and summing up this in himself, that he might make us to possess life. The word of God was made flesh by the dispensation of the virgin, to abolish death and make man live. For we were imprisoned by sin, being born in sinfulness, living under death. But God the Father was very merciful. He sent his creative word, who in coming to deliver us, came to the very place and spot in which we had lost life and break the bonds of our fetters. And his light appeared and made the darkness of the prison disappear. And he hallowed our birth and destroyed death, loosing those whose fetters in which we were enchained. He manifested the resurrection, himself becoming the firstborn from the dead, and in himself raising up man that was falling, lifting up him up far above the heaven to the right hand of the glory of the Father, even as God promised by the prophet, saying, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen, that is the flesh that was from David, and this our Lord Jesus Christ truly fulfilled when he gloriously achieved our redemption, that he might truly raise us up, setting us free unto the Father. Christ for you. Christ achieving redemption. Christ abolishing the old disobedience. Christ fulfilling the promise made to the fathers. Christ breaking the bonds of our fetters. Christ manifesting himself as the Son of God, declared to be the Son of God through the resurrection of the dead by the Spirit of Holiness. This is our God. He has achieved our victory. He has come to set us free. He has won it all. He said on the cross, it is finished. And so our job is to proclaim that. It is finished. He did win. It's over. The warfare has ended. The Lord has given you double for your sins. Your iniquity is pardoned. Behold your God. He's coming with the spoils of war. He's victorious. And he's coming to take care of you. He's coming to carry you in his bosom. He's coming to speak tenderly to you. He's coming to be your God. To be your shepherd. To preserve you. To save you. To cleanse you. To clothe you. To, to provide all that you need for life and godliness. And to bring you home to glory by his mighty power. Oh, saint, you can trust him. You can trust him. He died for your sins. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. This is what really matters. If you're not hearing this in your church, faithfully proclaimed to you, for you, week after week, you're being shortened, perhaps even robbed. This is your glorious inheritance. This is what Jesus died to give you. And so what you most need is to hear the gospel, to receive the gospel, to believe the gospel afresh, to be renewed in the covenant, to be renewed in faith, to hear once again what Jesus Christ has done for you. 
And of course, there's a life of gratitude. <laughs> of course. Of course, there's a life of gratitude. We have so great a salvation. We've been given the most amazing gift. So of course, there's gratitude. Of course, we love him who first loved us. Sanctification is a promise of the new covenant. It's not a threat. God's not up there, you better get your act together. He's not threatening us with the law. No, he is alluring us to himself through the gospel. We need the law, but it can't save. But the gospel, the gospel saves. And the gospel delivers. And the gospel is the power of God for salvation. The gospel is the power of God for justification, sanctification, and eternal life according to the covenant of grace. This is our hope. So I just encourage you pastors especially, study the book of Acts. How do the apostles preach? Go and do likewise. Get a copy of Irenaeus. How did, how did Irenaeus proclaim Christ to the Gentile world? He did it by following the apostolic pattern that Jesus himself taught us in Luke. <laughs> like, this is Christianity. Giving moral tips, that's not Christianity. Proclaiming Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us from all of our lawlessness, to purify for himself a people of his own possession, zealous for good works, to proclaim him and his excellencies in his saving office and his benefits and all of it for you, for even you. It's for you. That is Christian. That is Christian preaching. So my prayer is that you would study the, the, the text, right? Paul said these, these writings make you wise for salvation in Christ. You would learn how to read the Bible like a Christian, according to the apostles' doctrine. You would devote yourself to the apostles' doctrine. You would learn the apostles' doctrine and that you would be faithful in proclaiming Christ so that he can come to your people with the spoils of his victory, giving himself to them in marital love as our bridegroom, redeemer, and as their tender shepherd, scoop them up in his bosom and carry them home to glory. That's your job. So may the Lord strengthen you in that, bless you in that, and give you great vision to that end. And dear saint, if you're in a church where that's not happening, I would encourage you to find a church where it is happening. Because God is faithful, and he will always raise up the proclamation of his son. God bless.